you're deprived or you're sleep deprived. It can compromise your judgment. It can compromise your memory as well. You know, when I say lack of sleep, we're not only talking about getting a six or eight hour of sleep every day, but what I'm talking about is a restorative type of sleep, which means that when you wake up in the morning, you feel refreshed. You know, that is, that is very important. Okay. Um, I want to piggyback on what Dr. Dela Cruz just shared about how our diet affects our neurotransmitters, our brain, our nervous system, and so forth. And I know that uh, many in the medical of this book, The China Study, and maybe I can just uh, get a zoom in on that so one of these cameras can see that. The China Study is uh, work that was done, uh, Startling Implications for Diet, Weight Loss, and Long-Term Health by T. Colin Campbell, Ph.D., and Thomas M. Campbell II, uh, and uh, it is the most comprehensive study of nutrition ever conducted. I highly recommend you get this book. And there is a chapter, just to, to go along with what Dr. De La Cruz just shared, uh, there's a chapter here entitled Wide Ranging Effects, Bone, Kidney, Eye, and Brain Diseases. And here's what he says. Alzheimer's disease is also related to diet and is often found in conjunction with heart disease, which suggests that they share the same causes. We know what causes heart disease, and we know what offers the best hope of reversing heart disease, diet. Experimental animal studies have convincingly shown that a high cholesterol diet will promote the pro, uh, production of beta amyloid common to Alzheimer's. In confirming these experimental animal results, a study of more than 5,000 people found that greater dietary fat and cholesterol intake tended to increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease, specifically in all dementia in general. And then he says here, in, in other words, the combination of a diet high in animal-based foods and low in plant-based foods raises the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Rogers. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the China study. I just wanted to make a comment that the brain is essentially a, a, a chemical electrical system. And when we uh, eat foods that are full of preservatives and other chemicals, it's going to affect not only the brain, but all systems in the body, or just about every one. Uh, in the China study, my uh, uh, U.S. scientific peer-reviewed studies are actually quoted in there as part of a whole foods plant-based diet that cures this disease, cures that disease, cures the other disease. And I have actually had uh, a good number of Alzheimer's and other patients, including paranoid schizophrenics and so on, that you can totally reverse, get them off of their medications and get them back to living normal, healthy lives just by changing their diet, cleansing the, the brain and the rest of the body, and providing them with what they need in order to, to heal. I believe that God made our bodies to be self-healing if we just give it the right uh, uh, properties, the right things, the right elements that it needs. And it's really difficult, in my opinion, uh, to build a building that's going to last 100 years if you use poor building materials. Same thing with our bodies. You have to use good building materials if you want your body to last and if you want, to, want it to function properly. And uh, it works very well. Excellent. Excellent. Dr. Felix, thank you, Dr. Rogers. On the China study, um, I had an experience which wasn't very good uh, you know, for me. I went to a meeting a few years ago. You know, I want to say maybe a little more than a few years ago. But, um, and it was about liver disease. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, they, they were discussing about you know, hemochromatosis and hepatitis and cirrhosis and all that. Um, and the China study was mentioned, and I sat next to this to this Indian doctor, you know, mm -hmm. and we got to talk a little bit, and I forget all the details, but he was vegetarian, and I wasn't at the time. Mm -hmm. And then, obviously, the um, the discussion of, of the vegetarianism was presented, and we're not mm -hmm. talking about a religious Adventist meeting. This is mm -hmm. a secular meeting mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. there, you know. And and then he 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 turns to me and said uh, something like, you know, I'm vegetarian. See, that's good. And I'm thinking. Wow, I mean, I have the health message, mm. right? Mm -hmm. I was born in the church. I should be the one bragging about it. 
<laughs> there you go. You know, Very good point. Here I have mm -hmm. this guy bragging about his lifestyle. To me, mm, that's, who he, should know better, you know? He was witnessing to you, right? For his, with his... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's a very good point, Dr. Felix. Shouldn't we be willing and ready to share with others uh, any health principles? H how many are thankful that you know a little something about health? We don't know everything, but how many know at least something? Share it. Okay. So, um, okay, Dr. Uh, Dela Cruz. Uh, you know, just uh, in addition, you know, uh, to exercise, I forgot to mention that, you know, with uh, regular exercise every day, it also improves or, or uh, it uh, creates endorphins in your brain, you know. Mm -hmm. And what endorphins does is it, it's like an analgesia, you know. Uh -huh. That's why it produces analgesia, you know. It modulates the pain receptors in your, mm -hmm. in your brain mm -hmm. so that you can have a better or a higher, a higher more tolerance, you know, when you have pain, you know. So mm -hmm. that is also one of the, you know, uh, benefits. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Dela Cruz. Now, you mentioned about uh, exercise. Anybody else want to comment about how exercise impacts the nervous system? Um, I mean, I know a little something from personal experience, but I'd rather have some, one of you guys uh, share. Anybody want to share about uh, the positive benefits of exercise on the nervous system? Anybody? Okay, here we go. Uh, Nancy. Well, exercise calms the nerves. And, and, and this is a physical therapist speaking, right? Yes. So here we go. Listen up. Yes. Um, it reduces mm -hmm. anxiety and it can reduce depression. There's all sorts of benefits to exercise. Excellent. It increases the oxygen to the brain. You think more clearly. It burns mm -hmm. fat. There's so many benefits to exercise. And Amen. And you could just get a routine going, everyone, and stick with it. Excellent. So this will help us with the nervous system. Dr. De La Cruz, or, or, go ahead, Dr. Griswold. Well, I would just wanted to insert that <clears throat> ignore your health and it will pass away. <laughs> well said, succinctly. Okay, they actually, very good. They also did a lot of uh, uh, studies uh, on exercise and dementia, uh -huh. and what they found out is people who are engaged in exercise, you know, yoga, or anything that would improve the blood flow to the brain. You know, it mm -hmm. usually delays the progression of dementia. Mm. Wow. Um, yes, over here. Please, Dr. Rogers. Uh, you know, we're told we only use about 10% of our brain. Uh, I can hardly wait till uh, Christ comes back again, and we hopefully we'll be able to use all of it. Yes. And just think of the marvelous things we'll be able to do uh, at that point in time. But exercise is really a, a great thing for us to do. And as we all know, especially if you were here the, the night that I was speaking, I talked about all of the eight laws of health. And exercise is just one of them. Yes. Very important, but all the rest of the eight mm -hmm. laws of health are extremely important as well. And look, hold on, Dr. Rogers. So in other words, is it true, Dr. Rogers and all the rest of you, that really almost everything we do does impact our brain in one way or another because don't our nervous system travel in our complete body and isn't this the headquarters and, and so we're all, one sympathizes with the other in terms of the organs, the nervous system. Is that true? Any comment on that? Absolutely. The, the very first one, if you use the acronym WATT, REST for the eight laws of health, water is the very first one. Mm -hmm. If our brains have about 2 to 3% less amount of water than they're supposed to have, we already are beginning to lose the function of the brain and the way it functions and the way it's able to address what's going on around hey, us. Let me just pause you right there. Are there a lot of people that walk around dehydrated and they don't even Absol know it? Absolutely. Rule of thumb is take your weight in pounds, divide it by two, and that's the number of ounces minimum you should get in water every day. So in other words, if, if I am not getting enough water, let's just say... I don't, I, don't like, I don't like drinking water. Uh, maybe I'll have a soda here, uh, you know, but that's not a... Sodas what's that doing to my mental function? What's that doing with the nervous system? Sodas don't contribute to your water intake. In fact, they actually uh, can, can be the opposite and, and dehydrate, and they also demineralize uh, the bone. Uh, if you take a, a, a Coke, and we did this way back when I was like in the second or third grade. Take a Coke, put a chicken bone in it, then after two or three days, you can bend it like rubber because it pulls the calcium out of the bone. Wow. Try that experiment. Get it on videotape. Yes. Uh, 
This is uh, Luella. I'm Luella. I'm a registered nurse. I'm a, actually a home care nurse for Scripps. Excellent. Scripps. And I just wanted to say on Dr. Griswold's comment, and that was, if you don't take time for health, you will take time for disease. Yes. Um, yes. And there are lots of little things. I mean, think about Coke mm-hmm. as being the one thing that will take the grease out of the cement in your driveway. What is it doing? What is it doing? Inside your body. Mm. And mm. also, Coke, because it has caffeine, mm-hmm. is going to dehydrate you. Wow. Wow. Um, okay. That leads up to a question. Thank you, Luella. We're moving with the flow, and I'm glad she brought that up because here comes the next question. And here it is. Is caffeine mean? Is it a good fix or just nervous fits? Who wants to tackle this? About caffeine. It's in the ene family. Let's see. Nicotine, codeine, cocaine, Caffeine, it's in the ene family. It's a mean family. Stay away. Okay, go ahead. It's one of the alkaloids. And um, when you teach classes or you're participating in classes on how to get rid of uh, cigarette addiction, one of the first things they have you do when you're getting rid of the nicotine is to get rid of the caffeine. They're both alkaloids, and it's almost impossible Mm. to stop the nicotine habit if you're drinking coffee or tea or things that are loaded with caffeine. Mm. And the lady you were talking about earlier, Ellen White, tells us that we're not supposed to have any of those uh, enes in our body anyway because they so affect the entire body. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Anybody else want to say a little something about caffeine? All right, here we go. Uh, like Like I said earlier, it dehydrates your body, and when your body becomes dehydrated, it thinks that it's under threat, and it sends out adrenaline, and that's where you get that high feeling that energy and when you have adrenaline in your body and you're sitting at your desk and it's just sitting there it's a toxic to your body having so much adrenaline and at the same time it's also addictive when you drink coffee more dopamine is put out than usual and so then people become addicted to to uh, caffeine because they have that feel-good sensation and so um the north america is one of the i think most addicted to coffee and um it's really harming your body that's why um when you Drink water first thing in the morning instead of coffee, you, re- you can reduce your re- risk of heart disease. Most people drink coffee, which dehydrates your body. But, Earl, come on, it smells so good. The best part of waking up. I'm going to agree, there are better things to wake up to. And, uh, okay, so, yes, yes, go ahead, Dr. Rogers. Uh, yeah, uh, coffee is probably the most abused biological active substance in the world. There are so many precursors to different medications. For example, uh, we were just up at a teen institute up in the mountains with uh, about 400 teens. And uh, at the end of this month, we'll be at Pathfinder Camp Re. We'll have over 2,000 kids there. It never fails. At least one or more of the kids who are asthmatics leave their inhaler at home. And they're going to have to go home or leave the camp re or whatever. And one of the easiest ways to stop uh, um, an asthma attack is to have them drink two large cups of black coffee. Mm. Why? Because the precursor that's in the inhaler is found inside whole coffee. Mm. And there's just so many other medically active ingredients in coffee. Please, if you're addicted to coffee, Stop it. You're taking drugs day after day. You don't even know what they're doing to your body. But I guarantee you they're affecting your health. Yes, Luella. However, Dr. Rogers, if someone is addicted to three, four, five, a pot or more of coffee and they stop... (laughs) Yeah, Uh if they stop tonight, what are they going to have in the morning? They're going to have a massive headache. Exactly. If, if anybody needs any help getting off of, of uh, any addictions, including caffeine, give me a call. I can help direct you a, a real easy way to wean off of it. We do that with our, our patients uh, or people that come like to the five-day plan to stop smoking. One of the things we typically do is have them flood their body with fluids, drink lots of juices, drink lots of water, help to, to wash those alkaloids from both the nicotine and the caffeine out of their system very quickly. 
So the bottom line here is that caffeine affects the nervous system. And God speaks to us through the nervous system. So let me ask you this. Is the consensus on our medical professionals panel that caffeine is mean to our uh, synapses of the brain? I, I know that there's been some research in the past in which they uh, took a sampling of, uh, of individuals that drank coffee and contended that they drank it and felt that they have, were able to accomplish more. They were more uh, efficient uh, at the typewriter. I believe this is a while back, and they did a typewriter, to, and they discovered that the perceptions were warped. They thought while they were drinking coffee, they thought they were under the assumption they felt It seemed to them, they sensed, that they were getting more done, but there were more mistakes. That was the research. So so let me ask you this. Is it possible that a substance like caffeine actually kind of lies to to your nervous system? Let me ask you this. Is the... uh, coffee, the caffeine intake, is that kind of like a little nudge of energy, or is it a jolt to the nervous system? Come on, somebody talk to me. Absolutely a jolt. <laughs> and the, the study you just talked about is very similar to the things they've done with people that drink alcohol, mm-hmm. and they think that they're actually better at driving or doing this or doing the other, mm. and their senses are dulled as well, and their response times are slower on the brake pedal and the reactive problems on the road. And, and, the, and very similar things happen. If you continue to drug your body, you'll, you'll get what you feel to be a temporary uh, elevation in abilities. And then uh, if you don't keep that up, you'll get a real sharp drop off. And so you go right back into wanting more. And that's why the cigarettes and the coffee go so well together because they're both helping to that perception uh, of uh, enhanced uh, ability and awareness that's going on. Recently, I w- was at an airport don't know where, somewhere in the North America. And I stopped by the magazine store, and I, uh, this just riveted my attention. It's called Ideas and Discoveries ID. I don't know if you've seen this uh, magazine at all. I- I'm not saying go out and rush and get it, but this is a magazine, and the front cover story is how the lust for the, what? For the rush... The lust for the rush rewires our brains. And it has here, in here, it has arrows drawing to uh, or directed to this person's brain. Alcohol, cocaine, fast food, fast food, sugar, caffeine, adrenaline, the, uh, from the labs of addiction researchers, how the lust for the rush rewires our brains, and then inside here, which drugs affect me, in which ways, what happens when there's too much in my body, how is a rush memory formed, how the lust for a rush alters your brain. Anyone want to come? Lillian, please. Okay. I just was reading an article uh, yesterday, I think, and it was a convention of uh, doctors. And the hotel wanted to serve them. You know, they were going to have breakfast. Uh-huh. And so they served them juice and water. They specifically did not give them any coffee. Really? And the people were, doctors were saying, where's the coffee? Where's the coffee? And they said, we don't have any. And two, of the th- two or three of the presenters became so upset they could. They were so angry, they would not speak until they had their coffee, and so they had to rush out and get fresh coffee made and hold up the meetings okay. until they got the coffee for these physicians. Wow. So when wow. I did that, I thought, "Wow, <laughs> that is really addictive." Everybody say addiction, <laughs> Dr. Williams. <laughs> well, that was the easiest doctorate I ever got. <laughs> so this doesn't sound like an advertisement for five-hour energy. No, no, probably you, you not. Heard of that? Five-hour energy? Oh, yeah. No, go ahead. Oh, the little. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. 
No, now, yeah, any of you want to comment about about how now it's starting with the little with the kids with the teenagers okay, what what are they what are they called Timer. what what are they called what are they called energy drinks, e- energy drinks. there's even a, something called monster doesn't that like say something but you know kids want to be cool if it's called monster you know give me the monster drink you know wow jolt double caffeine double sugar Wow, energy drink. Oh, let me let me just ask this. Is this true energy or is this an artificial stimulant? Is it robbing from some life forces? What's going on there? What's that dynamic? Anything you want to comment, Dr. Delacruz? Usually, historically, uh, coffee or caffeine was intended for an enema. Wow. Yeah. For and enema. For enema. You yes. Know, and sometimes we still use this for a lot of my cancer patients. Yes, yes. You know, so, however, you know, mm-hmm. back to your question, you know, what does caffeine do? You know, is this really something that would really boost your energy, you know, or rewire your brain, you know? Actually, just like what he said, it's more of an adrenaline rush. Yes. You know, and what it does is it usually uh, increases the propagation of, you know, the, uh, uh, the nerve, uh, uh, what they call this, uh, the transmission of the nerves from one yes, nerve to another. Synapses. Synapses. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What we found out is, especially when we were doing our residency, you know, before we usually uh, spend long hours, you know, when, especially when we are on call. And then, you mm-hmm. know, and they found out that the more we were sleep deprived, you know, the more we make more mistakes in our judgment, mm-hmm. you know, in managing mm-hmm. our patient. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's why they cut back the number of hours. You know, but what they found out is instead of drinking coffee, you know, small cat naps. You know, mm-hmm. small Very naps. Good. In small between. cat naps. Yeah. That's why I think this is also how they get the, uh, the idea from European countries. Because in European countries, you know, you know in between their work, they, they take naps. Mm-hmm. You know, and after that, you know, they, they are more productive, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, what they do because of those naps, you know. So, and, you know, and they also found out, you know, they also did a study on this, in this in particular, you know, small cat naps, you know, for 10 or, you know, 15 minutes, you know, in between, it usually can rewire, you know, mm. your, uh, your brain cells again. Thank you, Dr. Dela Cruz. Uh, yes, Earl, you want to say something? Go ahead. When you think of people drinking coffee and all these energy drinks, these people want energy. They want to be happy. They want to be able to focus and um, do good in their work. And I think of Genesis 3 when Satan was um, tempting Eve. He said, if you eat this fruit, it will make you wise. You will know everything. And she, so she saw these things, that she saw it, that it was something good for her, that it would make her feel good and do good, and she would know everything. And it's the same with these things. People want to have energy and things. But if we eat the right foods, we drink water every day, if we exercise, these things will give us natural energy and it wouldn't hurt our body. Amen. Amen. How many want energy that's real and that lasts? Okay. Um, our time is uh, pretty much up. And I say we got to do another part two another night. Amen. Because I, I just got started uh, here and we got just too much experience and knowledge. We do have an experiment here in a moment that Dr. Griswold is going to do. Um, uh, okay. So here is a, one more question here. Anybody want to comment? I have a question. Can hydrotherapy calm the nerves? And what is hydrotherapy? Anybody want to comment on that about uh, can hydrotherapy calm the nervous system? Anybody know something about that? Yeah, uh, absolutely. It, uh, it's one of the best things you can do if you ever have a chance. There's so many benefits to hydrotherapy. I, I can't just talk about calming the nervous system. There are just a ton of benefits. But it, it does that, among many others, uh, to answer your question specifically, yeah. But you can do all sorts of really neat things with hydrotherapy, including boost the immune system. What is uh, basically, it's putting the body in water. And, and if uh, my ideal version of hydrotherapy is a hypothermic version, where you raise the body's temperature by putting the person in, in hot water or warm water, as warm as they can stand it, then slowly raise it. And you can also add oxygen to it using hydrogen peroxide in the water, which is absorbed through the skin, so you get an oxygen boost out of it. There's, there's just so many different benefits. But, yes, it will calm you down. It will relax you. 
And my patients that do our hydrotherapy treatments, typically after they've had one, will want to go to bed, and they'll actually, many, times, many of them will go to sleep for an hour or so. I'm just going to share a personal, almost a daily experience that I have. I hop in the shower, even in an RV, and I hop in the shower, and I discover that hot prepares for cold. Absolutely. Cold does not prepare for hot. No. Absolutely. I've noticed that phenomenon. That's number one. Number two, what I've noticed is that if I get out of the shower without ending with cold, especially if it's winter, you catch a chill easy. Yeah. Number three, I've noticed that it's the hot is relaxing. The cold is stimulating, but the interesting effect that I believe the cold has, Relax. it stimulates and then it relaxes. Absolutely. How does that? How does that happen? Anybody? Doctor Rogers well, and anybody else? One of the one of the interesting things when uh, I was being trained to to teach the the five day classes to stop smoking, we uh, learned about the studies done in the University of Minnesota, where they did what they called cold mitten friction, which is just basically get in the 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 shower, get it as hot as you can, have a bucket with uh, ice cubes and water in there and a, and a, a cold cloth, and rub yourself down and. and Doing that, you end up with actually boosting the immune system, avoiding a lot of the uh, upper respiratory infections, chest, colds, uh, pneumonias, all those things. The, the appropriate ratio for hot and cold is about half the time in the cold as you're in the hot. So if you're 10 minutes in the, the hot, you want to spend about five minutes in the cold. And both of those, as hot or as cold as you can handle it. And you actually, uh, I, I typically do this, and we have a hot tub at home, and I keep it about 108 or so, and I jump in. And it, then the, in the middle of the winter, even even in uh, Christmas time, I'll jump in the pool head under, so it's hot and cold. I call it fire and ice, and you sleep like a baby afterwards. Amen. Is his wife here to testify to that? I think she's there. There she is, front row. Okay. So you can testify. Sleeps like a baby after that. All right. And so, okay, well, we're almost done with this category and uh, because the next time, the sequel to this, we'll go into other categories, but a couple of quick questions. Let's see if we can do it in capsule form. And that is, how does, uh, can massage calm the nerves? Massage. Let's give some of these other uh, nurses or uh, other uh, individuals an opportunity. Uh, I can just say from very, very personal and very recent experience that if you have sciatica issues and you have back issues, that the right kind of massage yes. can really open up the nerves that are bound because the muscles have contracted around them. And where three and a half weeks ago I was walking with a walker, praise God, I am walking without Amen. and with no Amen. pain. Amen. And the same thing with plantar fasciitis. Yes. I don't know if the whole L4-5 was contributing to the plantar fasciitis, mm. Mm. but a couple of treatments, and that is quickly going away also. So this is therapeutic massage, exactly. correct? It's therapeutic. It's not just hands, you know, just it's nice it and so forth. No. It's very specific. It's, it's purposeful. It's intentional. Yes. Very good. Thank you for that personal experience. Dr. Felix. Just give me a minute. Um, on the touch, not mm -hmm. so much the massage part, but on the touch, um, there are studies that show that um, the, the laboratory animals that were mm -hmm. touched when they were babies uh -huh. compared to animals that were not touched mm -hmm. when they were babies, they have the same number of, of brain cells because those that were touched had more synapses. Say that again. Okay, so they were more intelligent than those who were not touched. Okay, Amazing. So the human touch uh, or touch is very important, not just for babies but for, mm. for humans. In fact, um, mm. I, think, I believe there are studies out there that shows that couples that kiss each other you know, daily, yes. on a daily basis, you know, they are happier, they live mm. longer, they live mm. healthier. Mm. So there is something to, to touch, to being touched. Mm. That is important Amen. for us. Amen. Just one real quick comment. There's actually a syndrome called failure to thrive mm. in uh, babies. And if you don't pick them up and cuddle them, they don't, they don't do well, they don't grow well, they don't develop well. Mm. And, and uh, like, uh, unfortunately, in some of the, the orphanages, like over in, 
in some of the countries in the Eastern Bloc and so on, they, they've noticed a, a big increase in failure to thrive babies simply because of the lack of human touch. Wow. So, and, and how many agree uh, we might be big babies, those of us who have grown, how many still like to be touched and hugged and so forth? Okay, very good. My mother, my mother says that uh, she needs 11 hugs a day to keep her motor going. Okay, anyway, you yeah, know, Luella. Pastor Mark, that, that's exactly the mm-hmm. reason why I'm at this church. Mm-hmm. Um, when I came into this church the very first Sabbath, I was mesmerized with Auntie Cindy at the organ. And Amen. afterwards, I talked with her and I said how much I appreciated her music. Mm. And she said, well, please come to Potluck. And at Potluck, I was immediately drawn into the kitchen, which is where I seem to have a mic- nickname now of Martha. Ah, oh, amen. But, um, the That's hugs, my mother's name. The hugs that we get from this church mm-hmm. is far superior to any other church that I've had um, a cause to attend. Well, since this is going all all over, yes. Ho- 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 hold hold on a second. Since this is going all over and it's being taped and so forth. What's the name of this church? This is definitely the Chula Vista Church in San Diego. Would you recommend this church to others around the world? In California, by all means. (laughs) You don't mind that advertisement, do you, doctor? Or or the pastor, pastor, pastor. Okay. Okay, yes, yes, sorry. Somebody want to say something? Okay, okay, hold, hold on a second. Oh, Nancy. Yes. Go ahead. I was just going to say that massage, it increases the circulation to Mm -hmm. the area. And whenever you increase the circulation, you're increasing the oxygenation. Yes. You're um, helping with the healing process. So therapeutic massage is good locally and generally. And it's very similar to hydrotherapy, too, actually. I want to just say this uh, on a personal note as well. As an evangelist, I speak for five weeks. I'll speak about 30 to 32 messages. Anybody who knows anything about public speaking, like the pastor Bradley Williams here and other professionals and so forth, knows that it's exciting. It, 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 God blesses and so forth. But it does take, does it take a lot of energy? Those of you who have experience getting up front, matter of fact, you don't have to be a public speaker. You might be doing the announcements on Sabbath morning and you get worn out. So I love this work. God has called me to do this. But sometimes I will get really just tired. And sometimes I need a therapeutic massage more than I need sleep. Now, this may seem to be a little bit strange. I've discovered that I can sometimes get overtired and, it, and my sleep suffers. Is anybody like me? Sometimes you get so overtired, it affects your sleep. Okay, I'm glad I'm not alone. I would rather go to bed a little bit late, stay up a little longer for that therapeutic massage, which I get once in a while there, and um, it induces, it calms the nerves. Is that true, yes or no? That it really, I, I know from personal experience. Okay, let's move on. All right. Uh, we have to conclude. Uh, how does music impact the nerves? And that is going to be our last question. How does music and does music affect our nerves? Now, and, and, and if I go into to Subway, I don't know if I should name things on, on the camera, but uh, if I go into some restaurant and they're playing really intense heavy metal or rock and roll, or if they're playing Bach, does it really matter to my nervous system? What can you tell me? Okay. Uh, well, actually, I'm not really quite sure what's the physiological impact of music on our central nervous system, but this is what we uh, uh, observe or even discovered you know, as a hospice physician. A lot of our dying patients who are having a lot of distress at the last stage of their uh, life, what we found out is you know, uh, uh, music therapy. It usually suits and provides a calming effect on them. You know? That's why sometimes we don't only resort on medications alone, but you know, we also use 
uh, a lot of this uh, non-pharmacological interventions such as music therapy, you know, to provide, you know, or alleviate a lot of their distress. Amen, Dr. Della Cruz. And, so I speak uh, Dr. more as Felix. A, I speak thank m- you. I speak more as a Christian than than a doctor now, but um, uh, I, I took my son to have a haircut once to a to a salon desk down the street here, and they had this. I think it was a Discover History Channel program on on the TV, and I was watching the show as he was having a haircut, and it was about music. So um, this secular program was showing music in in the centuries and into different indigenous things and making this research out of this. And they were saying how the rhythm that were played, you know, in, in, the, in, in the England or Ireland and, you know, those stones that they have there um, and how that has a hypnotic effect. Hypnotic? Yes, so on and so forth. And, they, I mean, this is, a sh- this is a show that was put out by secular people, not religious people. And I'm thinking I could have seen that same show within a church only seen by a different angle. Um, there is a hypnotic effect on, on some of the music that is played today. Okay, um, the way that and I, I won't get into details about the uh, the measurement and you know the the beats and all that kind of stuff, the two and four versus the one and three or whatever, um, but that has an effect in our brains that makes us sort of hypnotized. It takes us uh, it takes some of our defenses out. Okay, so a lot of times some things that would be morally completely wrong for a human being to do. By being under that influence, it becomes morally acceptable. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's something that w- I think we, all of us should, should have an interest in studying because some of that music is coming to the church, unfortunately. Some of that rhythm is coming to the church. So I think we need to be careful how we deal with music. Amen. There okay, are Dr. So Rogers, and we're going to wrap this real up. Real quick. There are so many studies out there that show in plant life, animal life, human life, the type of music that they're exposed to, uh, plants will actually die mm. with some type of music. Uh, they'll thrive with others. Mm. Chickens will lay more eggs with some type of music or less with others. Mm-hmm. Uh, cattle will grow better, produce more milk or whatever. Same thing with humans. And mm-hmm. uh, so uh, choices in our music and what we listen to and what we allow our kids to listen to is so mm. important. Hmm. And if, uh, if you've got a few hours, we can talk about music. <laughs> Amen. But we can't do it tonight. Luella? I just have a very quick story, and I'm going to try my best not to tear up because the story itself is very, very unique. Hmm. And that is there was a lady who was pregnant, and the doctor said he wasn't sure if whether or not he could bring her to term. But in the meantime, the little brother, the older brother, about three years older, Um, was starting to sing to this Mm -hmm. unborn baby, You Are My Sunshine. Oh, wonderful. And eventually they were able to deliver this baby, and again, in the NICU, they said, this baby is not going to live. Mm. And the mom said, but you've got to let my son sing to this Mm. baby. Amen. They garbed him up. Mm. They brought him into NICU. He was able to sing, and that baby went home the next day. Amen. 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 Wow. We're going to conclude, but I want to give an opportunity for Starry and for Sue to be thinking of any final send-off because I want to give everybody an opportunity to say something, and then we're going to have a little suspense because we have an experiment that I'm going to do in our sequel because it relates to my next topic that is on diet. This is the mystery bag. I got to do this. This is the mystery bag, and it's an experiment that kids are interested in, and moms and dads. Don't look in it, okay? Um, We got to conclude, but I want to give you guys the final word, and then I have a 30-second thing I want to share. Yes, Sue. My, my name is Sue, and I'm a medical surgical nurse. I work uh, evening shift, and it's about caffeine again. Um, sometimes I'm charting at midnight. I'm really, really tired. And what really wakes me up is two glasses of water. Amen. I'm dehydrated, working hard all shift. And, you know, I'm 
And that really is amazing how it perks you up. Excellent. Star it. I have a friend who has. Uh, I have a friend who has a garden with mango trees, and Loma Linda, and um, she used to play music, classical music, to those uh, plants, and they yielded more mango fruits. And wow. Also, uh, research has shown that children who listen to classical music, they have more synapses. They, are more, they become more... Say, say that again a little bit louder. I want to hear that. That's powerful. They have more synapses, connection to the nerve cells. Wow. So it makes them uh, more intelligent. That's the research that I read. So I think the type of music that we listen really affects our brain. Wow. Well said. I want to conclude by recommending a book that distills and that um, enlarges upon all that's been shared here and much more. He's my uh, personal doctor, Neil Nedley, MD. He has written a book entitled, this is his latest, called The Lost Art of Thinking. How to Improve Emotional Intelligence and Achieve Peak Mental Performance. Go get the book. You can go online, Nedley Solutions. And he has a whole chapter in here about how music therapy can help your brain. And bad music does have a detrimental effect on your brain. Well, I want to thank all of the panel. Give them a warm uh, thank you. And uh, we'll have a sequel, and those watching uh, 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 just want to say, pay attention to the contact information so you can get more resources. God bless you. Amen. Could have grabbed my Bible. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We're going to still get you out at a good time. You know why? Because I'm continuing. This is part two of the mark of the beast. And the message when America enforces the mark of the beast, tomorrow night. So we're going to pick up uh, where we kind of left off. And I'm going to ask uh, Ryan, my producer, to kind of bring us up to uh, clue number nine, and I'm going to give him a moment to cue that up to, uh, to number uh, nine since I don't have that in front of me. But in the meantime, take your Bible and turn with me to Revelation 13. Revelation chapter 13. Did we learn a lot tonight about your brain and the central nervous system? And we didn't exhaust it. How many want to think clearly? Amen. Thank God. Revelation 13, 
Revelation 13, by the way, where is the seal of God placed, everyone? In the forehead, not on the hand, the hand, the mark of the beast on the hand or on the forehead, the seal of God exclusively, solely, only frontal globe function on the forehead. So, clue number nine about the Antichrist beast. How can we categorically, unequivocally, unabashedly identify the infamous, prophecies most wanted, Antichrist. Well, we've looked at uh, uh, eight clues. Uh, Actually, we looked at nine clues, but we'll rehearse number nine. A power whose deadly wound is healed. All of the clues, ten clues, that help us to clearly, conclusively identify the Antichrist beast, all of these clues are right there in Revelation 13. They're all right there. Isn't that kind of neat to have it all compacted so you can turn to Revelation 13, you can be reading through each verse, and you'll see ten clues. Clue number nine, a power whose deadly wound is healed. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. So what events confirm the dramatic resurgence and healing of the papacy? The papal states, which were stripped from the papacy, were restored to them in 1929. And the San Francisco Chronicle front cover story read Mussolini and Gasperi sign historic Roman pact healing wound of many years. Did you read that? Did you hear that? Prophecy in the headlines back then, heal wound of many years. Well, I've got a question for you. Do we see this in the news? Has the wound continued to heal, going from a time when the Pope was taken into captivity and the Papal States uh, would eventually be stripped from them as well? And then they got the papal states back. What about in our day? The deadly wound is being healed. Is that true, yes or no? Oh, yes, the deadly wound is being healed. I mean, when the pope smiles, when the pope waves his hand, when the pope gets a cold, when the pope travels somewhere, when the pope opens the window at the Vatican, it makes the news. When the Pope says anything, it makes the news. He is the most popular religious spokesman on the planet. The Bible makes it very clear that the Pope is the spokesman for the largest professed Christian institution on the planet. And so the pontiff is a, this present pontiff, the Pope uh, Francis, Jesuit, uh, is very loving, lovable, humble man, as we can uh, sense. But what is being taught? What is being advocated? What is being practiced by this church, by this institution, by papal Rome? Well, there is a tenth clue. It's another major point. The beast has a number. And what is that number? Six, six, six. It's a power with a man at the top whose official title or name, it's designated official title or name, has a numerical value of six, six, six. The name of the beast or the number of his name, Revelation 13, verse 18. So a man would speak for the beast's power. So the question is this. The Bible says that we are to count the number of the beast. And the name that is given to each of the successive men that would speak for the 
beast power, each of those succession of men, the popes, would be given a name or be uh, a given an official title. It would be the highest ranking title. It would be an official title given to each of the successive men, popes, that would speak for this power. And the Bible says you have to count the number. You've got to compute. You've got to calculate. Well, since this is a Roman power, what kind of numerical system should we employ? What kind of numerical system? Roman numerals. It's a Roman power. Use Roman numerals. So what's the name? What's the official title of this power? Or the official language, pardon me. Latin. Everybody say Latin. That's the official uh, language. So you've got the official language, Latin, and you've got Roman numerals. Let's put the two together, and let's ask the very, very important pivotal question, what's that title? In Latin, it's vicarious filii dei. Translate that into English. It's vicar, representative, of the Son of God. Now, if to refresh your memory of the numerical value uh, in Roman numerals, uh, a V equals what? Five. I, one. C, 100. A, no value. R, no value. I, one. U, five. S, no value. Adds up to what? Uh, we've done the math for you. It's on the board, so to speak. 112. Filii, F is zero. I is one. L is what? 50. I and I, one each. 53. Then we go on to DI, which stands for God. And D is a whopping what? 500. E is zero. I is one adds up to 501. So add that up. 112, 53, 501 equals what, everyone? 666. Six, six. Coincidence or confirmation? So let's, let's give a snapshot review of these 10 clues that we have looked at uh, cumulative from last night's presentation and tonight's. Number one, all clues on the Antichrist beast come from Revelation 13. Clue number one, a Roman power. Clue number two, a religious power. Clue number three, a blasphemous power. Clue number four, a religious power dominating civil power. Number five, a worldwide power. The term Catholic means universal. Going on to number six, a persecuting power. Number seven, a power having supremacy for 1260 years. Number eight, a power that receives a deadly wound. Clue number nine, a power whose deadly wound is what? Is healed. Look at the news. Number 10, this is the clincher, a power with a mysterious number, six, Six, six. Friends, there you have it. This is irrefutable. This is conclusive. This is rock solid. Combine all of these ten clues, and they, the, the overwhelming cumulative clinching evidence points unerringly to Papal Rome. Papal Rome is the Antichrist beast of Revelation 13. Now, friends, don't get upset with me. Matter of fact, don't believe me unless you see it in your Bible on your lap or on your iPad or iPhone or, or, or your Bible at home and those watching. Just look at Revelation 13. Look at the scriptures. They leap from the page. So does the Roman papal system fulfill all those ten characteristics of the beast power? We have verified that in these presentations. Therefore, the most popular professed Christian system in the world is the papacy. The Antichrist beast of Revelation 
13. Now, friends, is that a shocker? It is. This is no lame, tame presentations you've been hearing. This is provocative, inflammatory, controversial. That's why, would you agree, the, the more controversial a subject is and the more, the more inflammatory it is, the more you've got to make sure that it's in the Bible. Ah, oh, but some people, oh, that's controversial. I don't want to study that. Do you know the most controversial figure that has ever lived was Jesus Christ? There is no more controversial figure on the planet than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ rocked the church in his day. He did not have the support of the religious leaders in his day. Do you think truth, by and large, would have the support of religious leaders in the last days, in, in general, in majority? No. Truth is always a minority in terms of, of people embracing it and believing it. A remnant. Everybody say remnant. So, the whole world will follow the beast in some kind of worship. When Satan showed up to Jesus in the wilderness, as I've referred to that a couple of times in this series of presentations. He appeared as an angel of what? Darkness or light? As light. And he actually, eventually Jesus knew who it was, but he actually had the audacity to tell Jesus to bow down and worship him. Can you imagine that? that the divine Son of God was being asked by a creation. By the way, God did not create the devil. God created a beautiful angel, Lucifer, who made some bad choices, and God would not force him to make a right choice because God does not force love. But the wages of sin is eternal death. So think about it. If Satan is that desperate for worship, has he changed? Unfortunately, he's more successful with mankind. But if we would follow the example of Christ, how did Jesus resist temptations and resist false worship? It is written. It is written. I used to work with Mark Finley. It is written. And George Vandeman, his predecessor. How many remember soft-spoken George Vandeman? There's only one George Vandeman, the late George Vandeman. He was the founder, speaker of It Is Written International Telecast. And once... George Vandeman was asked, who's the star of It Is Written, telecast? And he said, the star of It Is Written, telecast, is the word of God, Amen. the scriptures. And I'm so thankful to this day. Yes, there was Mark Finley was there, and, and then the baton was passed on to Sean Boonstra, and then now we have John Bradshaw and... I heartily recommend it is written as a powerful ministry that God is using to uplift the word of God. And there's another ministry you might have heard of for the last uh, number of weeks. It's called Forever Free Ministries. And uh, yes, uh, we founded this about nine years ago, and it's based on you shall know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. What kind of free? Forever free. How many are thankful for eternal truth? Amen? Amen? So the whole world will follow the beast in some kind of worship. All right, we know who the beast is. Everybody say, check. Now, what is the seal of God? Well, it's the opposite of the mark of the beast. You say, well, we don't know what the mark of the beast is yet. 
Well, where is the seal of God placed? And he cried with a loud voice, Revelation 7, 1 to 3. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Revelation 7, 1 to 3. What else does God promise to place in the forehead or heart? Now, we will discover in Scripture very quickly that in this context, the word on and in are used interchangeably synonymously. Proof positive, I will write my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. Hebrews 8, verse 10. The new covenant promise is that God will write the law in on our heart and mind. So point to where the law goes. I see people doing like... uh, What is it? Well, the Bible says, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. Now, this is interesting, in and on. Well, let me ask you this. The heart is where you make a decision to love God with all your heart and mind. But are heart and mind used interchangeably? Let me ask you this. Do you love your wife, men? Supposed to be a hearty, loud amen right about now. (laughs) Come on, men, you can do this. We need to have a marriage seminar. (laughs) Do you love your wives? So do you say to them, honey, I love you with all of my heart. (laughs) You touch me. I love you with all my heart. Let me ask you this. Last time I checked, that's a pump. Does this think, yes or no? It does not think. It's a pump. But we don't go walking around, I think. I love you. When the Bible says the seal is on the forehead, heart, mind, interchangeably. I will put my laws in their minds and write them in their hearts. I believe, though, that when you love somebody with all your heart, yes, it does go and affect your whole being, just as your blood pumps to your whole body and the brain sends signals throughout the whole body. Amen? And uh, so anyway, okay, let's move on. So where is the law of God placed? On the forehead. And so here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now listen. Is there therefore a connection between the seal of God and the law of God since they're both placed in the same place? Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. Now there you have it. Isaiah 8, verse 16. So therefore, those who allow the Holy Spirit to write the whole law in their hearts, including the commandment that contains the seal, will be sealed on their foreheads. So, the law of God and the seal of God go together. Are you with me thus far? Have I left you in the dust? Please say no. All right. Therefore, if you want the seal, you must keep the law in which the seal is placed. Are you still with me? All right. Let me illustrate. In ancient times, a king sealed a law decree with a royal signet ring with a raised design, image. And this ring usually had, okay, a raised design or image, and on it 
that would be impressed upon what? Pliable clay or melted wax. Can I say this immediately? If you want the seal of God, you need to have a heart that's pliable in the hands of the potter. If you want to receive the seal of God, God's approval, you must have a heart that's melted at the foot of the cross by the incredible, perfect love of Jesus. In the days of Esther, the king took his signet ring from his hand, and in the name of King Ahasuerus, it was written and sealed with the king's signet ring, Esther 3, 10 to 12. So the king's decrees or laws were signed or sealed with his signature or royal seal. Now, I don't listen to rock music anymore, but I remember there was a song in the top 40, signed, sealed, delivered, I'm yours. Ah, what about that idea, signed, sealed, delivered? Guess what? You will not be saved unless you're signed, sealed, delivered. You're his, amen? So... The Ten Commandments are called the royal law. Did you get that? So, how many agree? We serve King of Kings, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is our royal king, and we obey his royal law, and he has a royal seal. The King of Kings has a royal law and a royal seal or royal signature of approval. How many agree? You want the king's approval. And so, seal on those who keep the commandments of God. Revelation 14, 12 makes it clear that those who keep the commandments of God will not receive the mark of the beast. It makes it clear. So, what are three key elements associated with a seal? I'm glad you asked. What, you know, each president has a presidential seal. The seal contains Three elements. By the way, a seal has to do with authority, authority of the king. Seal contains three elements. Name, title, territory. That's right. A seal has to do with authority. So, God's seal of authority is related to him being creator. That's why he has authority. You didn't make yourself. Man didn't make you. God made you. Therefore, he has exclusive authority. And this seal is found in his law. So, is there a commandment which establishes God's authority as creator? Go with me to Exodus 20. It's right there. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus 20. Verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your works. Be scanning this this commandment. Scan because God bases his authority on the fact that he created us. The seal must be in the Ten Commandments. And that seal must contain three elements. Name, title, territory. Let's see if you can find it first. But the seventh day is the Sabbath up. Here comes his name. The Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made. There is his title. What's another word for made? So he who made us, What do we call him? Our creator. So there's his title. For in six days the Lord made or created. He's our creator. What's the territory? Not just the United States. What? The heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. And rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So the seventh day Sabbath has all the essential elements that make up comprise a seal. Therefore, the seventh-day Sabbath is the seal of the living God. A seal authenticates a document. And the Sabbath is the only commandment that even reveals who gave the commandments, who reveals the lawgiver. 
Now let's say that, that you didn't know anything about the Bible. You grew up in a pagan island somewhere. Nobody knew anything about God. But would you agree there's conscience? How many agree the Holy Spirit seeks to speak to every single person, whether they're Gentile, Jew? How many agree if there's somebody out there in a pagan country, the Holy Spirit's working in their heart? Amen? Seeking to work in them, work in them. How many agree God's given a conscience to every person? But they need Jesus. But Jesus lights every man that comes into the world. So let's say that a helicopter, helicopter lowers on an island the Ten Commandments in stone. And a replica, let's say. And so the Ten Commandments are lowered, and then the people there on the island, they, they, they don't have a religion. They're just kind of, but they're kind of feeling like, they're kind of sensing, and they're wondering, you know, why are we here? And I'm going to agree. People have questions like, what am, what am I here? And what's my future? And where did I come from? And, and then they read the Ten Commandments. I have no other gods before me. Don't make images and bow down to them. Don't take my name in vain. And thus far, I wonder, well, who is this? And let's skip over the fourth one for a moment. Honor your father and mother. Who is saying this? Don't kill. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't covet. None of those commandments says, who gave these Ten Commandments? We know they came in, and I think there was a helicopter dropped them, but who gave this law? There's only one commandment. It's the fourth commandment. That's why God's seal is in it. Name, title, territory are all there. The Sabbath is a seal of the living God. So what is God's special sign of power and authority? Moreover, also, I gave them my what? Sabbath to be a sign between me and them. And the word sign and seal are used interchangeably uh, at times in the Bible, the book of Galatians, for example, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. So the Sabbath is a sign of Christ's power, God's power to change us, to convert us, to save us. To sanctify them means to make them holy, to set them apart, to change the heart. How many are thankful that Jesus Christ does change our heart? The Sabbath is a sign of a character change by the power of Jesus. A, a sign of Christ's power to change us. Now, it's called sanctification. How many believe Jesus has changed your life? has changed your life. How many agree he continues to do that? Do you know that every day, in a sense, every day we should be born again? Every day we should experience reconversion. Let me ask you, how many of you are married? How many agree every day you should tell your wife, I love you and I appreciate you? How many agree, keep the love alive? Amen, right about now. I'm threatening you with a marriage sentence. No. <laughs> no, actually, that wouldn't be a threat. That would be a good thing. Seal the servants of our God on their foreheads. Seal the law. Keep the commandments of God. All right. We know who the beast is? Check. We know what the seal of God is? Finally, Knowing what the mark of the beast is, is very simple now. We've done our, our work. We know that the papal power is the beast. We know that the seal of God is the seventh-day Sabbath. So therefore, we know that the beast must have a counterfeit of the seventh-day Sabbath. Does the Roman Catholic Church have something that it set up 
that is a counterfeit and a contradiction to the seal of God, the seventh day Sabbath. Is there a counterfeit? It must be a counterfeit of the seal of God. It must be a counterfeit of the law of God. It must be a counterfeit Sabbath. You see, the beast is symbolic. The image is symbolic, the name is symbolic, the number is symbolic, the seal is symbolic, and the mark is not 666 tattooed on your forehead or on your hand. It's symbolic. It's spiritual. So what is the mark of the beast? A sign of the Roman church's power. God says the seventh day is a sign of his power and authority. Does the Catholic church recognize something as being a sign of its authority in religious matters. What does the Roman Catholic Church claim is the sign of its authority? Are you ready? This is taken from a Catholic source in 1923 from the Catholic record. Quote, direct quote, Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Now, what part of that don't we understand? You say, Mark, I find this hard to believe. This is shocking me. Don't believe it unless you see it in the Bible, history, current events, and I'm giving you the sources. Don't believe me unless I've given you the proof. And how many agree there's something about truth? It's like a diamond. If it's a real diamond, the more you look at it closely, it's multifaceted beauty. It shimmers and glimmers. So it is with truth. The more closely you analyze it, you can dissect it, you can do, you know, question it and probe it and everything. It just shines brighter and brighter and brighter. But false teaching can't handle probing. Why do you keep Sunday? Well, you say, because Jesus rose on that day. I say, well, that sounds good. Did he tell people to do that? Did Jesus, the risen Savior, say, I've changed the day. Now it's not number seven. Now we're going to number one. My friends, from Genesis to Revelation, God's special number is number seven. That's a special number. And my Bible tells me in the last days there's going to be a counterfeit of the seal of God that will be popular, pleasing, seemingly plausible, but false. Here's another quote. Of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act. It could not have been otherwise, as none in those days would have dreamed of doing anything in matters spiritual and ecclesiastical and religious without her. And the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and what? Authority in religious matters. Who said that? H.F. Thomas, Chancellor for the Cardinal, back in December of, uh, I, can, I can see that, 1895. Well, there you have it. Sunday is the admitted mark of authority of the papal Rome by their admission. Did the Bible predict that the Roman papal power would change the Sabbath? Did the Bible actually Predict that, go to Daniel 7, 25. And I have it up on the screen. 
Daniel 7.25. He shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints the Most High and everybody together and think to change times and laws. What do we call the laws of the Most High? The Ten Commandments. Ten fingers, ten toes, ten commandments. Not a coincidence. So, the Bible says here that the Antichrist would change times and laws. What's the only commandment that has anything to do with time that it would change? The seventh day Sabbath. That's right. Changing times and laws. Mark of the beast. The counterfeit law. Counterfeit Sabbath, the mark of the beast. Nobody has it until it's enforced in the near future. No one receives the mark of the beast until it is enforced. And so, friends, the most popular day of worship came from the most popular professed Christian church, the Church of Rome. You say, well, Mark, why do not more preachers teach this? They have hidden their eyes from my Sabbath. Have you ever tried to share something that you knew was the truth, and you tried to share it with somebody, but you could just tell they were not going to receive it. They closed their eyes. So who has authority to change God's law? So friends, tonight, Tonight, I present to you the hour of decision. The Sabbath, God's authority as creator, or Sunday, man's authority. You see, the real issue, the showdown issue in the last days, are you going to follow man or God? As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we know that salvation is a free gift purchased by the blood of Jesus. But Jesus, you said that if we love you, we would keep your commandments. And we know that only those who love you will be saved because we're called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Lord, write your law, including the seventh-day Sabbath in our heart, because we want to love you. But Lord, we are weak. We are sinful. And change is not always easy. So I'm asking, Lord, for strength for all of us to not only have wisdom to recognize the truth, but the desire and the power to make changes in our life, to be in harmony with your word. Please, dear God, bless everyone here and those watching to be of good courage, not to be afraid of change. Lord, I'm thankful that at times of ignorance you wink at it. We know, Lord, that there are many Sunday keepers that have died and will be resurrected when Jesus comes, and they'll be saved. Many of them will be saved because they didn't know any better. But those of us who are living, help us to follow the light, the light of truth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. When you leave tonight, you have some homework. You're going to receive a handout about Forever Free Ministries. And I want you to read it. And I want you to pray for our ministry that God will guide and direct. We are starting up a YouTube channel. And you'll hear more about that. We'll tell you more about that in online school of prayer and so forth. But uh, also read the lessons you are receiving. And also go to the Chula Vista uh, website and you can see some of the programs that uh, we have presented. God bless you all. Amen. How we just cited um, uh, Joshua, I think.
As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You want to say that with me? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. One more time. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Wonderful commitment. Okay. Christian, would you come help me again? I can't think of anybody better to help me than a Christian. You're a real Christian. Okay, this is tonight's yeah. meet. This is actually it's not. No. We're going to give right. out the testimony. Oh. Some people like to share oh, yeah. what they receive, and if they receive the mark Could, of the would beast, would you talk into the mic because yeah, the sure. people online won't hear it. <laughs> Sometimes you like to share what you receive if you get the mark of the beast. Well, it's kind of hard to just share the mark of the beast if you don't have a foundation. So we're giving out the testimony, uh, uh, Mark's testimony, part one and two. Uh, Pastor's prodigal come, comes home. The DVD. And also, Seven Secrets Cookbook. All right. Which has a lot of. All right. Thank you very much stuff. for picking those out. Okay. All right, Christian. Thanks for your help. Absolutely. Any good sport? All right. Who who is going to get time, what Pastor. here? Robert Zamero. Zamora. 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 Yeah, Robert. Robert Zamora. Robert. Please come up. Which do you want, Robert? What what's that? Said that's what I want. Oh, hey, okay, thank you very much. That's very nice. Okay, you get to draw two more. All right. Charles Kubrak. Charles Kubrak. Mr. Kubrak, Charles. Come on up. Okay, all right, very good. The testimony. Okay. Now, now, you know what would be a miracle? You know what would be a miracle? You'd, you'd draw a name of somebody that really wanted this book and really likes to cook. Let's see what happens here. Cecile Sanchez? Oh my God. <laughs> she really wanted the book. Yeah. Do, do you really want this? Yes, of course. You really do? Yes, I know. But you do. Yes. Do you like to cook? Uh, not that much. <laughs> <laughs> But you really want it, huh? Yeah, I really want it. Should I give it to her? (laughs) All right. God is good. God is good all the time. God is good. Well, it's time to go home. Have a good night. Drive safely. And we'll see you back here tomorrow night. All right. Good night.